Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. On today's show, best-selling author Chris Hedges on empires in decline and how they eat their own. A new community space opens for dreaming in New York. And a few words from me on rights versus issues. Wouldn't you rather have the former? Stay tuned. There aren't a lot of people out there who are both great investigative journalists and fantastic rabble rousers, but our next guest is one of them. Chris Hedges was a longtime foreign correspondent with the New York Times, but he's now seen more often in the streets at rallies. His most recent book with Joe Sacco is called Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, and we're very glad he's taken a moment to come back to our studios. Hi, Chris. Thank you. You are spending a good amount of time out there in the streets these days. Last time I saw you, actually, I think it was at Flood Wall Street. Yeah, yeah, I got sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> so were you more comfortable on. in the streets or in the streets? Uh, I kind of draw my sustenance and my strength from those actions because it's the only community by which, uh, you know, in which I can communicate and feel any kind of solidarity. So. They're actually quite empowering for me. Um, it's why I spent so much time hanging around the People's Library in Zuccotti with all the retired librarians. Um, and and why I miss it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, given the stance that I've taken in terms of my critique of the corporate state uh, and call for uh, civil disobedience, acts of civil disobedience against corporate power, um, it, you know, it's often a very lonely stance, and um, you know there are many times in which I am speaking and delivering this message where it is not received well, yeah. uh, and so yeah, I, I I can't sort of get enough of it. <laughs> I loved Flood Wall Street. I, I thought it was great. I thought it was. I thought it was great because unlike the climate march. Yeah, this to, it, just to fill in our audience, this is the direct action that took right, place near Monday Wall Street morning. right after the big climate Right, with no permits. Nobody allowed the police to say whether or not, and we didn't know when we stepped onto the street. We gathered in Battery Park in the mornings, a few thousand of us, and we didn't know when we walked out on that street whether we were all going to be zip tied and hauled off to jail uh, because there wasn't a permit. And when we got to uh, you know, that center of the financial district, the police uh, set up a kind of cordon to, so that half of the street would remain open for traffic. And everybody started chanting, you know, whose streets are streets, and they pushed past the police and blocked the whole street for the whole day. That's what we have to do, and we have to do it on a sustained basis. So that gets to the question of your last book, that right. there was the destruction and there was the reaction right. to it. What's the state of play on those two at this point? You know, Alexander Berkman, the great anarchist, wrote an essay called The Invisible Revolution somewhere around 1909 before, I guess it was before he shot through Frick, right? So, um, and he kind of brilliantly captures it in that all radical revolutionary movements or movements of revolt are unseen by the mainstream society uh, until they erupt and take that society by surprise. That all of that ferment that is going on, that discrediting of the ideology and ideas that maintain the elite are kind of subterranean. And I think that's right. I think that we've reached a point where the uh, neoliberal economics, the corporate state, um, the facade of a two-party system where both parties are utterly captive to corporate power is coming undone. That's, that is very much an undercurrent across the political spectrum. People have, have kind of had it. Now, it could go wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the skillful manipulation of a legitimate rage has been used uh, by uh, very frightening corporate forces and oligarchic figures like the Koch brothers and others in the way that fascism played on a very legitimate rage in Weimar or when I saw, I covered the breakdown of Yugoslavia and the civil war there, as I saw with ethnic nationalists. Again, in Yugoslavia, after the death of Tito, you had a very ineffectual liberal, self-identified liberal elite that wasn't able to get anything done in a way that the Democratic Party and figures like Obama or Clinton 
uh, use that kind of feel your pain language, uh, and yet, of course, are serving corporate mm -hmm. interests. And, and what happens, and this happened in Yugoslavia, is that as things go down, and it was precipitated finally, the, the, you know, the civil wars there by economic collapse, hyperinflation. Hyperinflation, which was also in Weimar, is kind of key often. Mm -hmm. When you lose confidence in the monetary system, when overnight everything you've saved is almost worthless or cut by 50%, then you lose confidence in systems of power. And, um, and what happened is an, an enraged populace turned on that self-identified, ineffectual, liberal center, uh, and, and not only threw them out, but then turned on traditional liberal democratic mm. values as well. And that's kind of what we're playing with here. Now, the other part that we saw both in Yugoslavia and many of the places that you've covered is the identifying of internal and external enemies. Right. Um, in many ways, we have that here, and we're right. seeing the increased policing both of the borders against immigrants right. and on our streets, now tanks being brought to quell right. local disturbances like in Ferguson, Missouri. We have wars abroad, of course. Connect those, if you can, for us. And what does that give in the way of challenge to progressive well, movement? Well, you know, the traditional collapse of empire, and that's any empire, I mean, from the Roman Empire to, you know, the Austro-Hungarian, whatever it is, the traditional collapse of empire is that, of course, it expands beyond its capacity to sustain itself, which we've already done. And as somebody who spent many years, two decades, on the outer reaches of empire, uh, in places like Iraq and, and Gaza, and it, I saw the mechanisms of control that empire uses, the very brutal uh, forms of violence uh, to sustain itself. And what happens is that empires hollow themselves out from the inside which we've done. I mean, drive across this country, look at our infrastructure, look at, you know, city after city. Empires also, by the way, destroy their cities first. So, you know, whether you're going through Cleveland, Detroit, you know, it's endless. Um, you will just, you know, boarded up warehouse out Trenton, I mean, and, and what happens is then as you disintegrate your economic viability, um, you don't invest in your infrastructure, you take uh, surplus labor and especially poor people of color and lock them in cages, 25% of the world's population, who don't generate money off the streets but generate money for corporations, 40 or $50,000 a year when they're incarcerated. The one type of slavery we never made illegal in this it's country. It's neo-slavery because of course they earn a dollar a day under the 13th Amendment. So uh, what happens is then you begin to have to cope with the rest of population and you and all of the me harsh mechanisms of control on the outer reaches of empire migrate back to the center of mm -hmm. empire. So you get drones, you get militarized police forces. I mean a night raid in Oakland, California uh, on a nonviolent drug offense for a warrant uh, looks no different than a night raid in Fallujah. Mm -hmm. uh, you have guys dressed in black, long-barreled weapons, uh, command and control centers, sometimes helicopters with searchlights. Uh, bur kicking down doors, it's exactly the same. Mm. And that's what happens. And Thucydides wrote about it, actually, when Peri after Pericles' death and they, on a, on a, the inability to stop the Athenian state from expanding its own empire, that the tyranny, Thucydides wrote, that you impose on others, finally you impose on, it, on itself. And that's very much the process that's underway in the United States. So what happens next? Well, what happens next is economic collapse um, of some form or another. 2008 kind of meltdown. There's been no regulation of Wall Street. Uh, they're doing exactly what they did before. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, some of our largest banks are zombie banks. Uh, and what they will attempt to do is go back and loot the Treasury again uh, to sustain their system of global speculation, which is just casino capitalism or gambling. But um, you listen to the same reports that I do week after week, or rather month after month, the Treasury reports that there have been uh, great gains on Wall Street, the Labor Department reports, there have been hundreds of thousands of jobs right. created. We're being given the message, the economy, there's a mis disconnect that people don't feel the recovery is happening, well, but it like, is. Well, like you, you know, like me, you don't believe it because it's not true. Uh, you know, we fixed, we cooked all the numbers. Unemployment. I mean, stop looking for work for six weeks, you're not counted. Uh, work uh, 28 hours a week, which is the average amount of time that a worker at Walmart works, puts you below the poverty line, you're still eligible for food stamps, you're counted as employed. Um, we know that jobs that had benefits, pension plans, uh, have 
were pretty much wiped out and they have been replaced, study after study has shown this, with low wage jobs. People are working 78 hours a week and still can't pay off their debt. And of course, much of this system of speculation is built on debt peonage. So the Fed is lending these big banks like Citibank tons of money uh, at virtually 0% interest. It's like, you know, you know, zero point something percent or something, but virtually free. And then if you're late on your credit cards, suddenly you're paying 16, 23% interest. Uh, you can't renegotiate your mortgages. Um, I mean, debt peonage throughout history, as African Americans understand very well, is a very effective form of social control. Uh, and that's what's happening. Um, so the, somehow, that the yeah, Wall Street's doing great under this bizarre system where corporations like Goldman Sachs are lent money for nothing and then lend it to us at usury rates. I'm not even sure that that's capitalism. I think it's a form of you know, extortion. Is anything going to change with the change of power in Congress, in your view? There are changes, um, obviously. Um, but substantial changes, I think, is the more important question in terms of trade agreements, in terms of the assault on Social Security, the cutting of um, you know, all sorts of social programs, including food stamps, the Democrats don't cut at the same rate, but they still cut, yeah. that the Republicans do. And, um, and I think that the uh, unpopularity of the Democratic Party really boils down to the fact that they seek corporate money in the same way the Republicans do, and they, they, they don't stand up for what working men and women want. And we know poll after poll, we're talking often in terms of 70%, in terms of a rational healthcare system, uh, in terms of uh, you know what we've done to students in this country, $1 trillion of student debt, the highest personal debt in the country, and this really sleazy deal where they freeze it for three years and then they're gonna pay more interest than banks pay and none of them can get jobs and they're trying to pay $700 a month. And uh, the, uh, you know, the inability to, to alter a, a structural system that is predatory by nature. And the Democratic Party may soften some of the predatory aspects or uh, perhaps not accelerate it as, as fast a rate, but they're not defying mm. it, they're serving it. Um, and, uh, and I think the faster we see that, and, and it's not a system that the Democratic Party, number one, has re any real interest in defying, I think we have to be clear, but number two, has any capacity to defy. I mean, there is no way within the American political system to vote against the interests of Goldman Sachs. It is impossible, whether Democrat or Republican. War is one of the topics, along with the failure to put any bankers in jail, that was barely touched on yeah. in these last elections. Yeah. And I want to bring you back to that as somebody who for so many years was a foreign correspondent yeah. and then for the last few has really been dedicated himself deeply to looking at what's happening here. How do you bring them together, and where do you see the connections being made in useful ways? First off, what do you think about increasing troops back in Iraq again? Well, it's insane. I mean, you know, the, the, it's a kind of stopgap measure because we've lost the war in Iraq and we've lost the war in Afghanistan. And I think the Obama administration would love to pin it on the next administration, like all administrations. But it's over in both countries, um, and it was a colossal waste. Um, in Syria? You know, Syria is a mess. I mean, you know, I mean, every time I hear the term moderate opposition, I just, you know, having worked with these groups. Um, but they don't learn. I mean, they understand the people running these, uh, you know, running empire at this point speak exclusively in the language of violence and force. They don't, they don't, they're t utterly tone deaf culturally, linguistically, historically, religiously. Um, you can really boil down what's happening in the Middle East to something relatively simple. And that is that the Muslim world does not want to be occupied by the U.S. military, and they will not stop resisting until the U.S. military leaves, and, if, and it will leave. If you had been Obama, would you have not acted with those videos of beheadings by people claiming to be but it's, but it, but Islamic it's not, State on the television? But we have to understand that that was a reaction. You know, we've been brutalizing these people for over a decade. And we have decapitated through our drones, our aircraft, our missiles, far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated. And when you brutalize people to that extent, they become brutal. You see that eruption of brutality. But 
you don't see all the times they stood over the rubble of homes and saw the bodies of women and children and elderly uh, over and over, day after day. Uh, and that's the failure, the inability to understand the consequences of indiscriminate violence and what it does to a captive population. So if you don't have an Air Force, then you have a symbol of imperial superpower in the form of a captured journalist like Foley and a knife. Um, but there is no moral difference between a beheading by ISIS and a drone strike by America. And in terms of U.S. reactions, was there an alternative? Well, the, the sane reaction is to get the hell out of there and stop occupying their countries and stop, you know, these drones circle 24 hours a day. It's 24 hours a day of terror because you know at some point somebody's, you know, some wedding party or something is going to get blasted to smithereens. What, what any state at war seeks to do is paint those who oppose them as barbarians, as uncivilized, as animals, um, without understanding that if we were in that position, uh, many of us would not react any differently. And I actually wrote a column about this called How the Brutalized Become Brutal, and I went back to the Sobibor uprising where Jewish inmates who had had their families wiped out got knives and went into the office where the Germans were and said, this is for my mother, this is for my father, this is for my children, this is for all the... It is a very human reaction. I quoted J. Glenn Gray in his great book, Warriors' Reflections on Men in Battle, who talked about, he fought in World War II, about soldiers whose families were destroyed. And he said it wasn't about revenge. It was about the utter annihilation of the enemy. And that is what we're seeing in ISIS. What we don't see is that we caused it. Yeah. Where do you see possibility? I'm not going to ask you if you're hopeful, but uh, what well, are you inspired I don't share, by I don't these share days? the America's mania for hope. <laughs> Me neither. Um, it's a kind of childish, infantile, you know, every it's, uh, you know the endless sea of happy faces. No matter how bad it is, at the end, you know, we need that uplift. I just spent too many years in war to buy into this crap. Um, I'm interested in seeing and explaining as much as I can where we are, and it's not good. Yeah. And I'm interested in exploring what human nature is and how it reacts. And I've certainly seen human evil up close, what we're capaci our capacity for human evil, which all of us have. Um, and I think, you know, it's better to confront reality, however bleak it is, than to feed a kind of uh, you know, positive message of uplift. Um, because I think that to do that, you have to ignore what reality is. And in fact, that's, a, that's disempowering. Um, because I think part of what's important at this moment, this pivotal moment in human history, where we, we are seriously contemplating the extinction of the human species, we have to understand that we're in crisis. The planet is in crisis. We now live under systems of totalitarianism, mind control, mass surveillance that is unlike anything any human society has ever seen. And I covered the Stasi state in East Germany. Uh, and we have to begin to find effective forms of resistance very, very quickly. Uh, and, and, you know, quite literally, if we're going to survive. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Hey, we're in the build room at the Mayday Space. Mayday Space is a community center. They're hosting the People's Climate March Arts group, and we are making different pieces for the march here. If the People's Climate March taught us anything, it's that spaces, that physical spaces, for people to gather, to dream up ideas, and make really cool stuff are absolutely necessary for movement building. Hey, what's up? My name's Sandy, and I'm part of the Mayday crew. We are turning this brand new building into a bar, cafe, and a space for arts and activism. We need your help to take this project to the next level. It's so important to support Mayday because it's the kind of space that's making sure that Bushwick grows in a way that's inclusive and that's healthy and that's sustainable. 
Mayday is an exciting project with many moving parts. On the ground floor is Mayday Bar. We are working with contractors and designers to make a space that is inviting. This is the heart of Mayday. It is the cultural and economic engine of this whole vision. It's important to have a nightlife destination that really brings together people in worlds of music and dance with people who are interested in organizing and community building. So when you come have a cup of coffee, when you bring your friends to drink and dance, you're directly supporting community space on the second floor. This is a place where you can host film screenings or workshops, classes on anything from nutrition to tenants' rights. And this is our co-working space, so we're going to have really affordable desk rates for people to come together, collaborate, build community. Mayday is also home to two badass grassroots organizations. Make the Road, New York's largest immigrant-led organization, is expanding its classroom space and organizing power into Mayday. I'm personally excited about Make the Road being at Mayday, not only as an organizer for Make the Road, but also as someone who grew up in Bushwick. EcoStation will be transforming the 4,500 square foot roof into a farm in the sky. EcoStation is really excited about Mayday. We have a new office, we're going to have a new farm. It gives the community this big open environment within Bushwick. Here at Mayday, we see ourselves as a citywide destination. We also want to hear from you about the kind of events that your organization or community group would like to host here. This is a place for you, and we really want you to be involved in it from the get-go. Human Rights Day is coming up. It's marked every year on December 10th, an occasion on which the world celebrates the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the U.S. lies about what's in that document. On December 10, 1948, the UN General Assembly, by a vote of 48 to 0, adopted a sweeping agreement. After two world wars in which governments, including elected ones, had waged war on their own citizens and on each other, the Declaration was conceived as a global code of conduct for governments, drawn up by people, not of any one nation, but all of them, to be enforced together. In the U.S., when it's marked at all, Human Rights Day is typically an occasion for rank hypocrisy. To take just one example, in 2009, President Barack Obama chest-thumped his way through a statement about the important U.S. role in drafting the Declaration, and then he went on to shrink the rights in it to a teacup. The right of people to, quote, live as they choose, gather, speak, and have a say in their government. Even as he spoke about those inviolable rights, the U.S. government, of course, was violating them. Worse than that, beyond the routine violation of the few things American presidents are willing to accept just might be human rights, the 44th president continued a decades-long tradition of systematically robbing American citizens of lots of other rights. The framers of the Declaration believed citizens had every legitimate reason to expect social and economic rights, like the right of every person to have access to health care, housing, and education. Take a look. The right to be free of abuses like um, torture is all very nice, but there are 30 articles in the Declaration, and those have been elaborated on since in agreements and treaties the U.S. has mostly refused to ratify. Social and economic rights have deliberately been erased, even as an idea in the U.S., because where Eleanor Roosevelt and the post-war signers saw human rights and government responsibilities, U.S. capitalism saw dollar signs and profit centers. It's taken almost 70 years for some human rights, like the torture one, to become respectable and meaningless. You can sue for the violation of your human live free from torture right, if you like, but good luck if you've ever been called a terrorist or a scary person. U.S. civilians can be ordered to bomb other nations for disrespecting human rights, but they'll have a far harder time suing their own government for things like affordable housing, education, or healthy neighborhoods. In the U.S., those aren't rights, they're just issues. And we are free to talk, gather, and start a million distinct organizations about them, and then to petition our government and the rich people behind it to share what they've got with the rest of us. Good luck with that. When it comes to our rights, for some very specific reasons in this country, we're foggy on the concept. Tell me what you think. Write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at GritTV.org. Thanks. For 
us making the film, I think the takeaway is really just that this issue is so much more complicated than you ever could imagine. People think that they do this casually, that they didn't think about it, that they just put it off because it wasn't convenient. No, these are women who find themselves in intolerable circumstances and are willing to do anything to be not pregnant. If there is a violent reaction, and there may be, it's, it's you know, again, it's, a, it's, I'm not condoning it, but, you know, to understand is not to condone, but we must understand. Um, the mass media will use it in the same way they use the atrocities carried out by ISIS to paint these people as less than human and to justify further repression by the state. Um, and and that is the insidious system of mass propaganda and a, and a commercial media that um, in the end acts as little more than courtiers for the power elites.